talk about the intelligence of fiction in the right way to speak this concept. But I need to issue a warning as far as she is concerned. On every single page of that book, nearly every single page, she asks questions which are crystal, absolutely crystal. She has some answers. Most of us are looking for answers, but she has more answers than many of us do. And it's a great pleasure to see how she looks at the entire field. I have gone through her book with its enormous delight. But also I should warn you that you might have to brush up your English a little. Uh, because every now and then, For instance, I mean, diurnal blue I can understand, but crepuscular pink I do not understand. <laughs> um, my little dictionary didn't help much, but I'm sure most of you will go and look up that particular word. Molly talks about the range of, of Rajasthan. Rajasthan. She does not touch the Pahari aspect of it. She's going to take you through, and I'm sure that she will lead us by the hand through all kinds of things, the connection between Rajput and Mauritius, the whether you are fond of Lala and Magnu, or you are fond of Indian sort of lovers. But she will do it gently, I'm quite sure. There are questions. She gives freely of herself. Her middle name is Emma. I'm sure she knows it, but may, many of you might not know it. It's very close to the Persian word Ayamma, which in the Mughal tradition or in the Mughal grant of land meant anything given freely without any charge, something like this. So Ayammas were grants which were given by the Mughal emperors to men of God them well and so on. So these are free tenures which are given by the Indian people. I am not going to take you too much into that book because it is her privilege and her right. Um, but like you, most of you, I'm eager to hear and eager to learn from you. Thank you for that very generous remain so, and I will never have as many answers as you. <laughs> um, the intelligence of tradition, is that too echoey? Can you hear me? Are we okay? Yes, it's yes. a bit echoey up here. Um, the intelligence of tradition had its beginnings in a year I spent in Jaipur when I was 22. I came here to apprentice myself to the renowned painting master, uh, who many of you will have heard of, Banu Vedpal Sarma. Banuji passed away several years ago, and I dedicated the intelligence of tradition to his memory and to his intelligence. He was a master of every major North Indian painting style, and he could switch from, from one style to another with astonishing fluidity. He had a library of illustrated books, uh, but he did not need to consult them to produce a basoli looking painting, or a picture that looked like it could have come from the workshop of Muhammad Shah. His knowledge was in his head, his heart, and his hands. My year in Banerjee's studio made me curious about how artists think and make choices. The more I looked at Rajput painting, the more it seemed to me that Rajput painters knew a lot more and were making more interesting choices than much of the scholarship seemed at that time to acknowledge. And I should say, actually, that Dr. Goswami really was an exception um, in this respect. He was really the first person who started to delve into who artists were, what made them tick. And, and I, I really mean it that that was a major inspiration for, for my work as well. So I, as I set out to research this book, um, my fundamental questions were these. How much did artists know? 
What did they do with that knowledge? And what motivated their choices? I looked at archival records and the circulation of compositions and motifs from one court to another to argue that Rajasthan painters were well aware of painting developments from all around North India. Many of them had extensive knowledge, which they sometimes drew on and sometimes did not. Typically, they borrowed compositions, figures, and motifs from other traditions, but they retained distinctive local court styles. Trying to understand why meant gathering together every piece of historical, cultural, and pictorial evidence I could find. I've offered more propositions than hard answers, but I hope I buried some old stereotypes and opened up a few new directions in the conversation on painting. There was not much archival uh, material to work on in the pursuit of these questions, and I, I used what I could find. Um, however, I had to derive many of my ideas from the paintings themselves. An underlying theme of the book became the relationship between pictures and the visual knowledge of artists on the one hand, and the verbal knowledge of scholars on the other. Banu rarely uh, explained anything. He knew painting in a very different way than I do here, and one learned from him by watching what he did. Um, the knowledge flowed out in his painting. I think he would have politely read a paragraph of the book, chuckled indulgently, and set it aside. <laughs> um, but then he didn't need me to tell him anything about painting. Words offer the one medium through which people who are not artists and who have not embodied a tradition can be led into artists' ideal, imagined world. And this is where the literary character of art history writing, I think, comes in. Art history is not just about understanding and explaining artists' ideas, but also about reawakening the pleasures that artists have wrought for us, and which we have often forgotten how to enjoy. There is too much that has gone wrong with the world for us to let past beauties slip away in time. So I thought today, just to give you a taste for the book's themes and style of argument, rather than kind of trying to touch on a little of everything, um, I would go into actually my last chapter. I've also secret, I've actually discovered that um, uh, when you write a book, everyone reads the introduction and most people are tired out before they get to the last chapter. <laughs> and I'm kind of fond of the last chapter, so I thought I'd bring that one out. Um, and it's about the Mewar court artist, uh, artist Choka. Uh, he painted mostly very end of the 18th century through till about 1820s, uh, 1820. Um, and I want to look at his creation of a romantic or Shringara style. Shringara is not really a word that interprets well. It's, it's, a, it's sort of amorous, romantic, a little bit erotic. Um, and, and I see him creating a style with heavily that flavor. So let me introduce the artist Choka. Got my PowerPoint. Could we have the PowerPoint on, please? Where are you, Shoka? All right. Is it clear on the other side? I think we're good. Um, I'm very used to, you know, teaching, and I normally I'd be walking up and down here and like sticking my finger in the screen. So I feel very contained over here. Um, the artist Shoka is widely admired for his confectionery colors. Am I okay with confectionery? It's a little like crepuscular. <laughs> confectionery, you know, like candy, tasty, sugary, colors, sensuous forms, and otherworldly ideals. However, at the time I was writing my book, Shoka tended to be treated as a rather brilliant primitive. I see him, on the contrary, as having painted towards a clear agenda with intelligence, feeling, and a cosmopolitan sophistication about the aesthetics of his day. To understand what Shoka accomplished, really have to go back to what uh, Mewar painting was before he became a master. His father, the equally famous painter Bagta, was a master at the Mewar court at Udaipur. Um, and I'm, I'm used to not, let's see, uh, I think we don't have the version I gave this morning, people back there. Hello, back there. I mean, we can work with this, but I gave an earlier and updated uh, version, which has something we could, we could uh, okay, we can do without that slide, I'll keep going, but I would love to have the one that I gave this morning uh, put out, if possible. Okay. Um, so, many of you in any case know where Udaipur is. If you go out and get on Highway 8 and go kind of southwest, you'll end up there after a number of hours. Okay, 
Um, so in the 18th century, um, portraiture dominated uh, Udai for painting. And elaborate scenes of court life, like the one I've got up there, and it's probably about you know this big, not probably, it is about this, this big. Um, elaborate scenes of court life, like this one, featured small portraits of the ruler, his nobles, and sometimes minor functionaries, musicians, and artisans. Um, this example pictures a Mewa ruler hunting with hawk. Uh, up there in the middle, I can't point, unfortunately, unless this shows through. Does that show through? No, probably not. It does? <laughs> Great. I feel re-empowered. Okay, so uh, here we go. Um, so uh, he's, ha he's hunting with hawks, and then let's just have a detail, enjoying a carnivorous feast, presumably of the cranes he's just caught. Uh, it's a little hard to see this backwards, but um, I think that there we are, roasting them on a spit. Um, scholars call paintings like these, let's just go back to the large version, call paintings like these contextual portraits. They're really portraits as much of real places as of real people because they purport to document the landscapes of Mewar in an almost map-like fashion. Contextual portraits were a kind of historical document. By the 1730s, many of them began to be inscribed with the dates and descriptions of the events they pictured, with the names of the people they portrayed, and often with the names of the artists who made them. The events they pictured were typical, that is, they were not unique historical dramas, but hunts, assemblies of nobles, religious festivals, and spectacular entertainments sponsored by kings. Such events showcased a ruler's ideal qualities, his strength, his prowess, his largesse, and his devotional fervor. Um, so, you know, essentially what you're seeing here is, you know, a king being kingly in this kind of age-old manner, but doing it, in this case, I believe it's 1744, you know, it's food day, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. So there's this sort of critical juncture in uh, contextual portraits um, between ideal uh, ideals set in real time, I the ideal and the real. This intersection of ideal and real was also characterized by a type of poetic history called the charit. In a charit, the poet expounds in detail on the natural beauties of the kingdom, the sophistication of its buildings, the happiness of its law-abiding subjects, and every detail of royal pleasure in the palace. A typical passage in a charit might describe the king in a garden pavilion, listening to music with the ladies of his court, and then follow him up to a terrace to observe him surveying the beauties of his kingdom. Paintings uh, like this one offer a similar kind of image, only in pictures instead of words. And here the Mewar ruler watches a dance at the top, bathes with his wives and courtesans in a saffron-tinged water, and strolls with him below in a rose-filled garden. It was the aim of poetry and painting alike to assure the public that life at Mewar was good, filled with pleasure and delight, and that the ruler's traditional virtues, his virility, strength, piety, and generosity were enabling an historically real perfection. In other words, painting was a kind of poetry and vice versa. In the later 18th century, however, the tradition of such paintings at Udaipur foundered. In 1764, Mewar was invaded and struck by famine. It descended into civil war, and in 1773, its ruler was murdered. The next two rulers took the throne as children and were not mature enough to repair decades of damage. Accordingly, most of the court painters uh, left to look for work elsewhere. And uh, so between about 1770 and 1790, Mewar painting seems to have you know, virtually ceased to exist. Shoka's father, Bajan, this is, this is in the moment kind of before everything falls apart. Uh, Shoka's father is working, uh, is the master of the court, uh, and here he is, um, so in this little far away, tucked away in this assembly scene, uh, we have a portrait he's made of himself. Uh, so he was working at Udaipur when these twin crises struck. Uh, Bagta left Udaipur and found employment with a high-ranking Mewar nobleman named Jaswat Singh, who ruled over Devgar, a city in the Mewar kingdom. Um, ah, here we do have the map. So I've got up there for you. I think you can see it. It's a little hard to point when everything's backwards. But Devgar uh, and Udaipur. So Bagta's working at 
Jaipur, he moved to Devgarh, and Shoka will be working actually in both places. Um, now, traditionally, Devgarh's rulers had employed court painters from Udaipur. Therefore, mid-18th century, Devgarh paintings mostly looked like Udaipur court paintings. But Jaswan Singh had new ambitions. In these fraught times, he came out in open rebellion against the Mewar Maharana and sought to establish his own painting workshop and to foster a distinctive idiom devoted largely to portraits of himself and his family members. Bhagta now began to paint for uh, Jaswan Singh in a wholly new manner. So you've got that um, on the left, contextual example of the contextual portraits he was painting before he left Udaipur, and then on the right, an early work for his patrons at Devgarh. And here the colors, shapes, and characterizations of the Devgarh prince's face are almost rambunctiously exaggerated compared to anything that Bhagta and his fellow painters had produced at Udaipur. Bhagta had begun to work in a new style. And if you want to read more on this, actually, before um, my, I, while I was working on my book, a superb book of, that Milo Beach and Ravit Nahar Singh uh, wrote on Shoka and Bhagta actually lay a lot of this um, out and, and made it possible, actually, then to move forward and ask, ask some other questions. So Bhagta's new style became the basis for a family uh, tradition. And it was taken up by his sons, Kamala and Choka. By 1800, the ruler of Mewar, Maharana Bhim Singh, had recovered enough finances to hire Choka back to restore Mewar's tradition of court painting. So what happens now? He goes back after this hiatus in painting. Um, he seems to have divided his time between Udaipur and Devgar. Choka's paintings resemble his father's, but they are distinctive. Um, scholars have tend, or at least used to criticize him a bit for seeming kind of generic. So if you look at um, his father's faces, they're just full of character. I mean, Bhagta was a wonderful portraitist, bringing out the sort of crazy individuality of faces at the court. Um, Shoka produces more idealized faces. You can see that kind of lotus eye. Um, I don't think there's any evidence really that Shoka was interested in the specificities of portraiture. Um, rather, his comparatively generic faces make sense as expressions of what did interest him, which I would argue was the forging of powerful, aesthetic, and devotional ideals in painting. So let's look some more, uh, more closely at Shoka's choices. When composing portraits, Shoka did not radically Shoka did not radically separate himself from Mewar's earlier painting tradition. He, he's at his most Udaiporian portraiture. He retained certain standard Udaipur conventions. For example, on the model of traditional Udaipur court scenes, he methodically reproduced court hierarchy. So who's who and where they're sitting, all of that's always been important at Udaipur. It tends to result in a decentered composition with the ruler at the one side, and Shoka does that much as the painters before him had done that. Um, however, there's almost a cheekiness in the way that he cited earlier pictorial conventions. When we compare the dwarfish, sorry, Shoka, this may be an unfortunate word, but here's a detail from one of his court scenes, and, and the figures um, in, portrait, in his portraits tend to be quite short and stout, and when we compare those to his images of beauties, you know, the beauties are really tall and slender and long, and I think... Um, we see he's really, it's not that Shoka kind of conceives of uh, people as short. Um, he, he really understands that in a, in a traditional court painting, they should, they should be made to look for, uh, short. So here we have the, um, an example, a detail from an earlier Udaipur court scene, and you can see how kind of short the figures are. So Shoka, I see Shoka kind of saying, okay, well, I'm doing a court portrait, and, uh, or a contextual portrait, and so I'm gonna make my figure short too. That's kind of in the tradition. Um, so he didn't conceive of bodies as, as short, but he seems selectively to have made them that way to locate his contextual portraits within the larger tradition of court portraiture. Against such moments of conformity, though, are Choka's many departures, all of which tend towards an extraordinarily sensual intensification. Choka's principal innovation for the Mewar ruler, Bhim Singh, was to fashion for him a powerfully sexual presence. A series of portraits depicting the Maharana with a wife or concubine were unusual in the degree to which they emphasized the physicality of the lover's encounter. Bhim Singh's giant hand grasped his beloved's comparatively diminutive wrist and pulled her in close to him. This was a classic 
typical gesture in Indian painting, but the size differences in this scene and the emphasis on the ruler's sheer volume give it an unprecedented power. The Maharana is naked to the waist, his arms are like thighs, his stomach rivals Ganesha's, and his man breasts are swollen. Necklaces fall over his chest like the contour lines on a map, and bristling body hair works like chiaroscuro, like shading, to give volume to Queen Sing's flesh, rendering him ponderously male. And here is a detail from a second example of this series. Shoka carried this aggressively tangible physicality into more formal betrayals. And let's go back to the one I started with. In this roughly half life-size portrait on cloth, for example, and to my knowledge, no Mewar painting had ever shown the Maharana bare-breasted in such a formal format. You know, you see him maybe bathing or in a kind of scene of pleasure, but not kind of, this doesn't become part of his sort of formal identity until now. Um, and there's a peahen, get my glasses back, peahen over there, which I think brings the message home that Queen Singh is male beauty in full display.
workshop seems to have been quite small at this point, much, much, much smaller than what we see at Jaipur at this time. Um, the style is very distinctive, but it's in the manner of um, court paintings that, you know, there is workshop involvement and probably other hands involved in uh, producing Shoka's paintings. But Shoka is certainly the mastermind of the workshop at this point. So um, I think to understand what he's doing, we have to step back to consider Rajput painting generally. Contextual portraits like those preferred earlier in the century had been taken up as one mode, one way of, of political legitimation all over Rajasthan, but they constituted a comparatively minor genre of painting at other kingdoms. At the courts of the Kocha and Kishinger kingdoms, of course, I know most of you don't really need a map here. I'm used to talking in New York or you know LA, but you know, for, for a few of their foreign visitors, that they're Kocha and Kishinger, so also in Rajasthan. Um, poets and painters at the courts of the Kocha, uh, of Kocha and Kishinger preferred to render their rulers um, as resembling or even being the Hindu god Krishna and to visualize their local kingdoms as Krishna's realm. And I'll go into this a little more shortly, but here is a painting from the Kishinger court. And it is, you know, there's a lot of artistic fancy here with these brilliant red walls, but uh, it is clearly, uh, these are a couple photographs I took in Kishinger. It is clearly uh, the Kishinger palace and lake um, and so Kishinger kind of becomes the realm of Krishna in these paintings. So I argue that the sensuality of Shoka's portraiture actually owes a great deal to what was happening in the Kocha and Kishinger tradition. And let me go back now to Kocha. Um, so Shoka's elders were familiar, certainly, with paintings from the Kocha court. So for example, Shoka's colleague Popa here uh, was looking directly at either this or one another version of this Kocha painting uh, when he made the painting on the left. Mewar painters had been making pictures of Krishna and Radha, and here actually you see um, Krishna dressed as Radha, and these are off in the groves meeting in the, in the, in the woods. Um, so Mewar painters had been painting these subjects since the early 1600s, but they had traditionally um, organized the various moments of the lover's story into sequential compartments like these, often with this kind of intense red. By contrast, Kocha paintings, like this one, um, tended to focus on one narrative moment. Such scenes treated painting as a comparatively autonomous art and less like book illustration. Shoka explored Kocha painting much more extensively than other Mewar painters had. One of his uh, earliest portraits of Maharana Bhim Singh, which is dated 1803, repeats an established formula, the king on his horse riding to a hunt. Where conventional equestrian portraits had typically had nearly empty backgrounds, Shoka's background here uh, extends past a lush temple garden into the depths of a stormy sky. Shoka has taken his garden here uh, from the painting tradition at Kocha. The tree that overhangs the garden wall is a recurring Kocha motif. You see it's up here, as is the stormy sky. And I'm just giving a detail from a uh, Kocha painting, um, as is the stormy sky and the temple spire that pierces the forest canopy. The effect of the Kocha citation is to introduce a hint of mood of hidden spaces and a possible narrative into an otherwise generic equestrian portrait. Shoka soon began to make a specialty of the sort of love scenes favored at Kocha. Forgive the black and white, this is originally a colored image, but just to show you that uh, the composition from Kocha then uh, Shoka is picking up and taking on in his own very distinctive way. <coughs> so the most direct precedents for his representation of Krishna catching Radha at her bath are from Kocha. And Shoka made at least two versions of this Kocha depiction of Krishna bringing the cows back to the village at dusk. So you see that he takes the composition, but he's really making it his own, right, with his own colors and his own stylization. Like Kocha painters, Shoka also began to identify his patrons with the god Krishna. The inscription on uh, the back of this Kocha picture identifies Krishna as also Kocha's ruler, Maharal Arjun Singh. In Shoka's paintings, both his Devgar and Mewar patrons share with Krishna the same 
sort of Perry corpulent ideals. When you're looking at the paintings, there's this obvious kind of connection that's made between the rulers and Krishna. That Choka intended to conflate the god with his patron is made in, for example, explicit, in, for example, this painting, where Krishna is milking a cow. Um, and I'm just giving you that detail here and a detail from that portion of Dean Singh I showed you earlier. Um, the crescent moon that appears above Maharana Dean Singh's forehead and what shows up in Mewar portraits uh, is the symbol of Shiva. Uh, it, the Maharanas owed allegiance, primary allegiance to Shiva as a Glingzi, and so this was the sort of um, way of showing that in painting. But notice now that Krishna actually has the same Shaivite crescent moon in painting. Um, meanwhile, Krishna's uh, cloak and staff down here um, really mirror or echo the shield and sword of the ruler that often appear at the bottom of the um, love scenes. So there we go, just to give you that, that detail. Um, so Krishna in this painting is basically being identified in some way with the ruler of Mewar. Kota painting was not Choka's only inspiration. Choka placed a stylistic allusion to Kishinger painting at the heart of his idealized love scene. Okay? So here is uh, Choka's marvelous um, ideal. And many of you will know the Kishinger ideal. It's the most stylized and kind of extravagant of the um, Rajasthani ideals. And here is kind of what a Mewar beauty looked like before Choka's time. So Choka's heroines have uh, like the Kissinger ideal, a similarly narrow head, hyperbolic, hyperbolically arched eye and brow, abruptly slanting chin, and long narrow nose, though Choka has incorporated each of these features into his own softer, rounder style. So there's like sort of an allusion to Kissinger painting, and yet it's still very much Choka's idiom. The similarity of Choka's heroine to the highly stylized beauties of Kissinger painting has been noticed before, but was uh, assumed to be coincidental. Yet there is evidence that Choka was as aware of the Kissinger tradition as he was of the Kota tradition. Um, and this page, here we go, there, um, really is a, it's attributed to Choka, certainly produced during his time and out of his workshop. Um, and uh, it's repeating this kind of central uh, scene from a Kissinger image of the saint Sukhdev. Meanwhile, um, the striking citation to Kissinger painting here, so I'm giving you, I've reversed this, but here is that again, that fabulous Kissinger ideal of Krishna. And um, we see, see a citation to that. This is a detail from a wall of the Pindalas of the city palace in Udaipur. Um, and you can even see, now that time has taken over, that the artist had to work a little bit and correct himself to get at an idealization that wasn't kind of natural to him. Um, but certainly the eye and the brow are pure Kissinger and not at all like what you would expect of Maywar. So there's a sort of reference to Kissinger painting at Udaipur at the same uh, time. So I propose in my book that Choka intended and expected his audience to perceive these references to Kota and Kissinger painting. And that he was inviting us, his viewers, into an intelligent conversation about painting, tradition, and aesthetic. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, one aim in my book was to establish that patrons and artists were extensively, extensively familiar with a wide range of traditions, and that they responded to these traditions in knowing and purposeful ways. We know that Rajput patrons from all around Rajasthan were bound together by extensive family ties. We know that they and their artists traveled, and we see compositions that must have traveled because they've been painted in multiple regional styles. The documents tell us about people traveling, artists traveling, about rulers giving gifts or paintings to one another. Um, none of this was, I guess, obvious when I started writing the book. I had a lot of people saying, you know, that these kingdoms were fairly isolated. Um, so I, I hope, I believe, I hope I've made it difficult to argue that Choka's viewers would not have been able to perceive his references to Kota and Kissinger painting. If we understand that Choka was actively alluding to other traditions for the benefit of his viewers, then we have the opportunity to ask why. And when we ask why, Choka's paintings begin to become, I think, a good deal more interesting than we had realized. The sum of what I had looked at so far, Ch 
Dakota's allusions to Dakota and Kishigar paintings, his orchestrated sensual effects, his corpulent hero, and a preference for erotic subjects, all relate in his paintings to the fervent Krishna devotion of his era. In the 18th century, as Mughal power waned in Rajasthan, Krishna became the most powerful source of royal legitimation for the region's Hindu rulers. By Troka's time, the subject of Krishna was dominating the arts of most regional courts. At Jaipur, Kota, Kishingar, and Bikanir, Krishna was a focus of royal ceremony and court culture. Krishna was devotion was centered in the region on the icon of Sri Nathji, who, as many of you will know, is worshipped at the town of Nathdwara in Mewar. And, you know, many of you will know uh, Sri Nathji, he's a form of Krishna as a child. He holds up a mountain to protect his friends from a deluge. The religious community that fostered Krishna devotion at Nathdwara was, is, the Vallabha Sampradaya, and it's still active today. The community promotes a highly personal and emotional connection to Krishna. In the 16th century, Vallabha, the leader of the Vallabha Sampradaya, began to seek royal support to build shrines and temples and to spread the community's teachings. As part of this effort, Vallabha developed Krishna's identity as a prince. Krishna was to be bathed, dressed, fed, and entertained like a prince and housed in temples that resembled the mansions of the wealthy. By the mid-18th century, rulers were buying in gifts to him and to the Sampradaya. The Kishinger ruler, Rup Singh, dedicated his kingdom to one of the Vallabha Sampradaya's main icons, while his successor, Savant Singh, wrote devotional poetry and ultimately renounced the throne to dedicate himself to Krishna's worship. Meanwhile, the Kota rulers marched into battle with their Vallabhite icon of Krishna and declared Kish Krishna to be their king. Traditionally, the rulers of Mewar had not been able to visibly to play up their support of Sri Nathji because they held a primary allegiance to the <coughs> god Shiva. Uh, and if you will remember, the crescent uh, again being a sign of that allegiance. However, Choka seems to have been updating Mewar and Devgar paintings to bring them into conversation with paintings from the Vallabhite kingdoms of Kota and Kishingar. By alluding to their painting traditions, he may have been setting the ground for one of his central achievements, namely the development of a style of painting perfectly suited for representing the world's Krishna. Arguably, Choka's explorations of strong thematic palettes go beyond anything Rajput painters had done with color before. Often he reduced his palette, I should leave the slowly painting out of that, <laughs> but it's a different kind of intensification of palette, really. Often he reduced his palette to a dominant hue or a single level of brightness. For example, he produced several night scenes. Dawns and dusk offers another realm of mood. Here we go, crepuscular blues. Right. Dawn, blues, and greens, and a Joker <coughs> style painting of Radha bathing before sunset um, are matched, sorry, I'll just go back to that, bathing before sunset are matched in pastel quiet by the gentle pink of the lady's skin, presumably to show them touched by the ambient light. A painting of Radha sleeping at dawn um, is similarly filled with soft tints of the same value which extend into the pink of the frame. Often Choka made color variations on the same composition, and here is that composition again we saw that he took from Kota, but he's making two very, very different versions of it as if he were trying for different moods and effects. Choka's depictions of Krishna and his friends coming home uh, with the cows shift from the red accents of sunset, here picked up in the clothing and blinds, notice all the orange touches all the way through, um, to the misty, almost moist values of advanced dusk that swallow up the palette to leave just a tinge of red. Sunset falls on one painting of these lovers, while another version here is set in a gentle lavender gloaming. Such effects are consistent with what we know about the aesthetics and practices of the Vallabha Sampradaya, which had incorporated Indian aesthetic theory into its practices and beliefs. Indian aesthetic theory dates back to the early years of the Common Era. Many of you will know this. Dr. Goswami sort of really set the the stage for our thinking about this and his work on Rasa. 
Uh, the theory conceives of nine moods that a successful work of dance, music, drama, or art should awaken in its audience. These moods are called rasas, which mean literally juices. The experience of a mood or rasa entails a loss of self through complete absorption in the aesthetic experience. Being overcome by rasa was often equated with mystical union. The Vallabha Sampradaya understood the experience of Krishna to be an aesthetic experience. As the community's founder, Vallabha, wrote, rasa, or mood, is Krishna. Vallabha took this phrase from the Bhagavad Purana, which is, as many of you will know, tells the story of Krishna's childhood and adolescence. The Vallabhites particularly revered the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Purana, which describes Krishna's childhood and first love. This is the text's most sensually vivid chapter. Its infatuating language invites a voluptuous experiencing of Krishna. And uh, Vallabha's commentary uh, goes as follows. Touching Krishna, kissing the nectar of his lips. I'm being told to hurry up. <laughs> and we can skip forward a little bit, but anyway. Touching Krishna, kissing the nectar of his lips, enjoying him sexually, peripolating your hands your hair standing on end, hearing the sounds he makes when speaking, singing or playing the flute, as well as smelling his fragrance everywhere, moving constantly to be near him and meditatively imagining him at all times, this alone is the reward of all who have senses. Even liberation, if it is other than this, is not the proper reward, just as abiding forever in darkness can never be the reward of the eye. It sets the stage for painting beautifully, doesn't it? As this passage suggests, the book gave special prominence to the erotic mood, and it was a mood that depended on all the senses, but particularly sight. The text, uh, which had become increasingly important in the 15th and 16th century, centuries itself makes a connection with aesthetic theory. It addresses its readers as connoisseurs with a taste for the beautiful. Someone, in other words, capable of experiencing the text's aesthetic flavor, and through that flavor, Krishna. So I propose in my book that the Choka developed his intense pictorial effect partly in response to Radhasan-wide experiments with picturing the ra uh, rasa, or moods, of Vallabhite theology. Um, and I'm just going to skip forward here a little bit, but just to say that, you know, as many of you will know, Vallabhite puja is intensely visual and sensual with smells and orchestrated colors and a, a lot of this kind of intensification of effect one sees in, in Vallabhite practice. Um, I, I would say that there's a lot about courtly culture that comes into this too, and that's something I can maybe discuss in, afterwards. Um, but let's get back to the paintings. The language of mood is employed in painting inscriptions. An inscription on one of Choka's father, Bhaja's paintings, for example, describes it as a scene of Krishna worship intended to express the mood of Krishna's forest bower. In short, Vallabhite beliefs and practices which linked aesthetic theory to Krishna worship were integral to the daily lives of Maywar's artists and were almost certainly a vital inspiration for Choka. I suggest that Choka was looking to Kosha and Kissinger paintings because he recognized and wanted to build on their strategies for conveying the moods of Krishna in the courtly art of painting. And indeed, Choka showed himself to be acutely conscious of the status of his pictures as sacred imagery. In a painting of Krishna teasing a sleeping Radha with his flute, one of the god's hands continues to hold the position right there of Krishna Murlidhar. You know when he's got the, I've got an image coming up, here we go. When he's playing the flute, his fingers kind of stand, stand up just like that. And we're seeing that reference to the icon in the painting. Um, again, in the next painting, it's, it's even more obvious. Both hands hold that position, right? Um, so that is, in a sense, um, uh, it's as though um, it, it's as though the icon is kind of in love, kind of bending or melting into you know into the lover. There's a kind of shift from the iconic to the narrative that I think Choka is really you know very aware of here. Traditionally, uh, worship involved three-dimensional icons, but the founder of the Vallabha Sampradaya declared that painting could also be a medium for divinity. Vallabhite paintings would not merely represent Krishna, but could transmit his presence to the viewer. Um, and, uh, you know, traditionally, the icon, of course, looks at you for darshan, right, for that connection with the viewer. Um, uh, and in Vallabhite practice, 
object, a painting that does this, could become the object of worship. Um, but in a narrative painting, like the one that we've, uh, we see, and a detail from the painting we saw earlier there on the right, in a narrative painting, the divine does not reach the devotee through darshan. Rather, the profile, one of the fundamental uh, conventions of Rajput painting, elides viewers, just doesn't see us. Yet there's nothing in the theology of the time that technically precluded a narrative painting from functioning as an icon. If the sensual imagery of religious texts could awaken a mystical experience of union with Krishna, why not a sensually descriptive painting? Indeed, if Rasa was an embodiment of Krishna, the aesthetic experience in painting was a logical means to experience him. I would like to suggest that Toka was exploring the capacity of narrative painting to channel the divine not through darshan, but through the senses, and particularly through the orchestration of the amorous, or Sringara mood. And this, of course, just to conclude, does leave the question of, um, I'm actually going to, that's a, I'm going to skip that detail, we'll go to here. But where does, where does this leave us with paintings that are not explicitly uh, about <laughs> Krishna? Uh, and I'm just going to end with um, this five minutes. Oh, I'm great. We've got only five minutes left here. All right. I don't even have to rush. So to the extent that all mood is Krishna, as the Bhagavata Purana states, any subject in early 19th century Rajasthan was seen to belong to a cosmos reigned over and permeated by Krishna. So I'm going to end with the story of the lovers Kamakandala and Madhavanala, which Choka painted in several palettes and sizes. The canonical figuration of the story was established by the early 1600s, which is I do actually have time to, to see that. I was just here uh, at, the, at Bundi at the Bottle in the Hells in the early 1600s. Sorry, it's a bit of a dark scene, but um, uh, it does establish the image of the lover, Madhavanala, passing out at the sight of, uh, his, of the beautiful Kamakandala. And the scene there, um, even though it's not an explicitly Krishna story, Krishna doesn't come into the story, it is set in a Krishna universe. So when you look up to the top of the bottle in the hell, there is the Rasamandala, Krishna dancing uh, with the um, gopis. Um, the story uh, tells of the lover Madhavandala, who wanders in the disguise of a minstrel into the court of the heroine Kamakandala. He sees her and he faints. That's, there he is, fainting away side of her, uh, Choka's version. Um, Choka brings the Krishnite cosmos, which we saw on the ceiling at Bundi, but he brings it, I would say, into the very style of his painting. And he typically finds a way of signaling for us that he has done so. So um, here he follows the canonical 200-year-old composition to picture Madhavanala fainting away at the sight of his beloved. Her attendants are rushing to revive him. A hero's faint was often a turning point in Sufi love stories, in which the beloved is a reflection of divine beauty on earth. And the story of Kamakandala and Madhavanala very much follows that kind of Sufi mystical love story narrative trajectory. But uh, to my knowledge, it's never explicitly made Sufi. And here, clearly, in the Rajput context, uh, it's Hindu. Um, how does Choka make the mood of this moment alive for us? He structures clear opposites. The female extreme sits at the upper end of a diagonal that binds the lovers together. She sits erect, fully in command, rich with gold and smoldering with reds and oranges. Her feminine heat and strength ripple outwards in a flurry of red-orange activity. At the male end of the diagonal, the hero falls back, utterly limp in the wake of his response. He is a pool of cooler colors and grows cooler by the moment as the women fan him and offer him drinks. It is the vision of her beauty a painted beauty that has spelled him, impelling him beyond sight. Pictorial and erotic beauty, aesthetics and passion commingle and pitch the connoisseur lover beyond his senses. Uh, and here again we have Choka imagining a rotund Madhavanala. If we read this as an image that indeed associates the erotic with the aesthetic response, and now we've seen that the philosophy and theology of the time understood them as one, can we read the corpulence of Choka's hero as an expression of the connoisseur's appetite for the aesthetic experience? After all, the word for connoisseur is rasika, the taster of rasa. Rasa means juice. The terms themselves are primarily sensual. To conclude, Choka seems to have been linking his heroes to his patron to create a new ideal of the royal devotee as esthete. So notice how Choka links his lovers to his patron.
The White Palace with its sandy windows is the Udaipur City Palace. Wall, way up here, the Mewar uh, Maharana, Saivite Crescent emerges from the late evening clouds in a sky that is tinged with the heroine's red, yet cooling to the hero's blue. Madhavanala, exemplifying Ashoka's rotund male ideal, is implicitly also Ashoka's patron and the Maharana of Mewar. Meanwhile, the ashes on the ascetic hero's skin, a sign of his renunciation, suggest the blue of Krishna's skin. Uh, and um, meanwhile, uh, um, the yellow choti is simultaneously Krishna's choti, which the Maharana also was sometimes pictured to wear. So I think you can see how sort of clothing also gives ideas of, of association here. Um, and finally, of course, the hero with his musical instrument seduces, as does Krishna with his flute, and Krishna also often is pictured with a veena, uh, seducing with his music. Um, so he, in, in Shoka's aesthetic realm, the hero is connoisseur and Krishna, appetite and its satisfaction, hero, king, and god are one. Thus, Shoka satisfied established political and devotional aims in a knowing conversation with the art of the past and of neighboring kingdoms. For him, tradition was not stasis, but a practice that involved him in long-established, evolving means, imminent possibilities, and emerging exigencies. He was, in every respect, uh, every step respectfully traditional, yet he modified his court tradition to crystallize what his predecessors seem only to, to have suggested, the literally transformative powers of his art. We can open the floor to questions now. There will be some mics around if you look for um, my colleagues in the yellow vest. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much for that beautiful lecture. I wondered if you had ever spent any time considering, apart from the peahen, the short fat dogs in the pictures. Say that I didn't actually hear that properly. By Whether you have uh, considered the short stout dogs. Yes, well, the dogs um, are certainly meant to represent loyalty. I mean, they show up both in Mughal and Rajput paintings. Um, so there's certainly a lot more iconography there to play with. I uh, promise you the talk which will be as eloquent as my presentation. I wish I had been sitting in that chair. It's a good thing to be on the right side. If I hear that, they will find that chair. Which, which? <laughs> <coughs> in any case, so what Madhu has done towards the end of our is sometimes referred to when we use it in the English language. There's something to be avoided in the modern generation, to be dismissed or underplayed. And I contrast it in my mind with the Hindi word that we have, Sanskrit word that we have, which is parampara. Like the moment we use the word parampara, there is a, a kind of a thing in our mind something to be looked up to or looked 
back upon our, against parampara there is the word rudivad which is very you know conservative and which is very quote unquote traditional so the point that she makes both in her presentation incidentally the word the chokha comes in quite a lot the word chokha as you know in rajasthani and punjabi means excessive right
um, painters' families uh, become attached to workshops for generations. At the moment, I'm working uh, more on, on Beaconier, and the Usto painters at Beaconier had stayed with the Beaconier courts from the early 1600s. They're still living there. Um, and that kind of loyalty to a place, to a dynasty, mingled with workshop practices, with a sense of tradition, does produce, then, I think, these distinctive idioms forming. But to say, and, and uh, you know, I, I speculate in the book at a certain point that, you know, if you were a beaconier artist and you went to Mayvoir and you wanted a dog, you weren't going to keep painting in the beaconier style. I mean, you'd have to get on with what the local idiom was. So there was some sort of powerful force of these styles in each of these courts um, that, you know, would have been associated with the court, it would associate with its, its particular cultural pleasure. But it, it, it cannot be made so simple as, like, you know, the, a style is like a flag, a political flag. And there are many, many layers, I think, to what sustained these styles. I think what then became important to me was just, well, given that they were sustained, given that these differences were maintained, given that people knew about them, kind of what do they do with them? And um, you know, the whole question of meaning in Rajasthani painting is very complex, because rarely does one thing, one object, mean one thing. You know, so much of it is about association, about possibility, and about opening it up to the viewer as well, so that the viewer's interpretation uh, or handling of those possibilities becomes part of the meaning of the painting. And so I think style actually has that kind of layeredness and is full of possibility rather than you know a brand or a flag. Does that answer the question? Okay. I'm afraid we have uh, run out of our time before we are thrown out of the hall. Um, one, one last. question that I'm not going to be able to answer succinctly here. I would say that a lot of us are now working on the question of pleasure. Um, Sukh, uh, Dipti, Kara, who's written a dissertation on Udaipur, is, is found a lot of uh, interesting new material on the idea of pleasure there, and so I you know, look forward to seeing how that um, develops. Um, I, I would say, I guess as a sort of last point, um, I emphasize kind of the Vallabhite dimension here, but actually, I mean, if you look at the Vallabhite material, there really is an emphasis. So the, the erotic, the amorous is there, but there's a huge emphasis on, on parental love, right, which is another kind of pleasure. Um, so I think that the, the sort of more er erotic pleasure I described today has a lot to do with courtliness and a kind of courtly take on the Krishna world, um, and that needs to be worked on more. Um, and I, there's also an enormous conversation between the Mughal and the Rajput world about what pleasure is and how it happens. And I would just say that I know there's a lot of good scholarship going on right now, and let's see where that goes. And um, it's something I'm working on too, and don't have an easy simple answer for. That brings us to the end of this session. May I thank you very much? Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the festival sponsors, the entertainment and Raj Naganda, and I hope you'll join me again in thanking our speakers, Molly Emma Aitken and BN Goswami. Thank you. Thank you.